Welcome to Season 2 of the Making Bank Podcast, where we continue our exploration of South Florida's entrepreneurial landscape with host Keith Costello, co-founder and CEO of Locality Bank. Sit back, relax, and let South Florida visionaries guide you on an entrepreneurial journey from tribulation to triumph, sharing the very stories that have shaped them. Tim Petrillo, welcome to Locality Bank's Making Bank Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. We're uh, we're really excited to have Tim here because you know, as I was telling Ryan, it's one of the the guests that I've known probably yeah. longer than anybody else, yeah. and you know, so I mean, I remember when you were working down the Grove. Yeah, that's right. And, you, uh, you, you remember when I was in? Co- we met in college. When I was in college, you yeah, were, that's you were, right. You were right, Hensler. That's right. <laughs> and you were at uh, N- NCNB back then. Right. No yep. cash for nobody. That's right. NCNB. <laughs> But uh, no, so so it's great to have you here, and uh, and also it's great because Tim has been, uh, you know, a great friend, but also a great client of the two banks that I've run yeah. in South Florida. First, you know, Broward Bank Commerce, and then he was a customer at at uh, First Green and a customer at Locality yeah. and Investor. So yeah. you know, we appreciate your support, and uh, and you exemplify the kind of people that we love to do business with, a local entrepreneur, local businessman who has uh, has just done a great job. So so let's uh, start where we usually start with everybody, which is going back to your family, like growing sure. up. I know you're from South Florida. So sure. what was your family like and how has it grown up in South Florida? Well, well again, uh, very close family. Uh, you know, my, my parents were business owners. First, can I just say something? Yeah. I have known you for a long time and a lot of people who sit in this chair probably don't know how impressive your story is, right? Because I saw oh, it you, from Tim. from when you were working at NCNB and going to City National and so on and starting your own bank, starting your first bank in the most absolute worst time that you could ever try to launch a bank. Same st- time you started a yeah, restaurant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and and I remember us commiserating during our workouts how tough <laughs> yeah. it was and, and everything like that. So kudos to you and to see see uh, how you have grown and prospered and just killed it with your banks. Thank you, And I'm, I'm, my only disappointment was I didn't invest in the first one as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, my, my family life was, 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 uh, was great. You know, I had, I had two great parents who taught me the work ethic. I mean, they were, they were entrepreneurs in the true sense. They were always starting businesses. I, I never got the, I, I never knew what a kind of job or career father had, you know, like he, he was always going from business to business. So he wasn't a nine to five guy. So I just thought that was normal. So it was <laughs> kind of taught to me through watching him. And, uh, I knew I, through his actions and what he did every day, I knew I didn't ultimately want to work for myself. Uh, and that's kind of how I got the bug. Nice. Yeah. So, so you grew up in Boca? I grew up in Boca Raton. Yeah. Before Bo- Boca was an agriculture town. So that was before Arvida really came in. Uh, US-1 was the middle of town. Uh, <laughs> Palmetto Park Road, dead end of the military trail. Uh, so it was mainly agriculture. And uh, then Arvida came in in like the early 70s and just started building these uh, beautiful housing communities and marketed to the Northeast. And that kind of changed the dynamic of, of Boca. Wow. So you grew up here and you, you go to college yep. and you decide, you, know, you start thinking about what do you want to do and, and yep. what's, uh, what's that lead to? So, so uh, there, there was a point in college where all my friends, Ray, as you know, and, and, and uh, they were all really methodical and driven and focused. And that's all the things that I wasn't at the time. And I had a gut check at that moment and said, okay, what, could I see myself being successful at? And I was always in the restaurant business and it it's something that I enjoyed being in. So I transferred from business to hospitality from FSU to FIU for their program because FSU has a good program, don't get me wrong, but FIU, you have access to world-class restaurants and world-class resorts. So you can get real live work experience and go to school at the same time. So that's why I made the transition to FIU and that's okay. how I got in the hospitality program. And so you, you graduate and then what are you, what are you looking to do? How'd you get your first job? So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, uh, fate and, <laughs> and, and the harder I work, the luckier I get. So, uh, 
everybody in the industry that I respected, my brother was in the industry at that time, the, my boss, my current boss, some other uh, uh, people that I admired in the industry, they were giving me advice and they said, well, you need to go work for Houston's. They're a gold standard in training and things like that. And uh, I said, okay. So I applied to go, they were coming to FIU to do an interviews. They were conducting 10 interviews, uh, 300 people applied. I unfortunately got looked over, so I didn't get the nod. Just by coincidence, that same day, I am at the at the time I'm working at Mark's Place, which is it's the, the best restaurant in Miami. He got voted, he got top chef. So it was one of these celebrity chef restaurants that I was the bar manager, and I was working a couple of bar shifts there. And uh, this guy came in and sat at my bar. I started talking to him. Seemed to know a lot about the restaurant business. Uh, I asked him, wow, you're pretty knowledgeable. He's like, yeah, I'm in the industry. I have some restaurants. And lo and behold, it was uh, the owner of Houston's. And <laughs> and uh, literally got my job at that bar with him in front of me. And that's wow. how I went to the went, went to I never Houston's. knew that story. Yeah, that yeah. is really cool. Yeah. So uh, so went off, worked for them. Great experience. Uh, opened a bunch of restaurants for them. Uh, it was it was. It, it was such a great foundation learning from a company who was so organized, methodical with structure and systems and time standards and execution standards. So I learned I was a sponge and uh, I, I was with them, traveled around, opened up a bunch of stores with them. And Mark Militello, who was the celebrity chef, wanted to open up five restaurants. He came back and asked me to be his director of operations to launch these. And that was Mark's in the Grove, Mark's Place, Mark's Las Olas, Mark's Meisner Park. And we did that together. And then I decided to go off on my own. And so, and, and where did you meet Peter? Was that so, at Mark's? So yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so Peter was the executive chef at Mark's Las Olas. Yeah. And Peter is a rare chef in the sense that he's super, super talented at putting food on the plate and and great dishes and creativity but he also is super focused on cost structures and the the financial side of mm. the business which is which is great and it's a rare find so and he, and we have very similar personalities we got very similar uh you know we we drive the same standards so it was you know we've been partners ever since so so you and peter are there at, at and, marks yes yep. and so when does uh, the idea start so, so to, uh, alan do hooper something? who you know yeah yeah so <laughs> alan hooper comes to me and he says now we're both peter and i are having a conversation about doing a restaurant together alan he and some uh locals here alan was thinking about he wanted to get in the bar business so i had he was a contractor at the time i just, just bought a, a duplex I needed some contracting work done. He needed some cult consulting work done to be to you know, see if this is the restaurant he wanted yeah. to go into. So we did kind of a trade thing. So I drove around with he and his uh, potential business partners and looked at a bunch of different sites. And through that conversation, those that those that they were lost. They and I and I, I said, listen, Alan, you guys have no foundation of knowledge here, and you are <laughs> going to get just. You're going to get crushed, right, okay? Right. And to his credit, he he uh, he backed off that and thought about that, and he, he went to go talk to other people that he admired in the business world, and they all said the same thing. He's like, "Listen, if you're going," so he's like, "Well, why don't you be?" He had put a contract work on, on the on the real estate where Hemmerschi Barn Grill is. And he's like, "Well, why don't you be my tenant?" And I said, "No, no, no, no. Why don't, why don't we be partners?" And that's how he, Peter, and I became partners wow. in, in the restaurant. That's a great story. Yeah. So, so uh, how old are you at that time? I was uh, at that time. I was twenty three. Wow. 24, yeah, twenty four. So, so you had gotten all that experience in just a couple of years. Like yeah, Houston. Yeah, Marks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So I was. I was. Uh, I went to go work for Houston's when I was. 20 just 21 yeah and then i started talking to alan about this you know obviously it takes a long time for a restaurant to yeah happen. yeah yeah so so i was talking to alan about potentially doing something together before i went to go work for mark yeah and then by the time we lined everything up it was two years after i went to mark that we opened him or she and i kind of remember that time because I, I i can remember like people and i think maybe like ray and something yeah. talking about how you had like all your friends come help That's like right. fix that That's myself, right. We, right? We, had, we, had, <laughs> we had, I mean, we put together our, everything we had, right? Alan, Peter and I 
put thirty five thousand dollars in the pot. Yeah, and then we got about another fifty thousand dollars from family and friends. You know the yeah. the, the the old adage. Your, all your capital comes from the three F's, friends, families, and fools the first, <laughs> yeah. the first time out. Well, that's true for us. Yeah. And uh, so we opened that restaurant for 150000 bucks, and uh, but we were doing all the work. So my every time I had a friend, oh, come on, help us. And, and everybody was, the ongoing joke was, yeah, if I called, you're going to be painting or doing something soon enough. So, wow. but, but, you know, to their credit, and that's why I love them, they all stepped up and they all got it done, and it was great. It was it was stressful but it was it was great that's awesome so so you guys open Hemershi bar and grill yep. which yep. uh you, you know i'm sure anybody who's been in fort lauderdale for any yep. period of time remembers what a great restaurant that was i mean it was really a big success right yeah we were very fortunate so so we were on the west side of second street at the time where there was nothing really going on on that side there was there were some restaurants but the broward center just opened up it was just the museum of discovery and science was on science was on that side mm -hmm. And I remember, well, you know, if the Broward Center is on one side, the county campus is on the other side of it. This has to, you know, there's so much people going to be down here. It should work. And then at that time, there was some talk of the riverfront. They were mm -hmm. going to develop that. So, so we decided to launch there. And I remember my, we're finishing up on a Saturday night. And you know, this is when we, we went from construction right into operation. So we're we're finalizing construction, and we're planning to open. This is a Saturday. We're planning to open like the next Tuesday or Wednesday. And I'm on the I had a balcony. I'm looking on that street, and there is not one person walking on that street <laughs> on a Saturday night. Wow. And I just remember having this moment going, "Oh my God, this this could be a disaster." And you know, fortunately. Uh, it worked out and it was a it was a great catalyst for us it was a catalyst for that street we ended up redeveloping a lot of that street uh you know put tarp and bend there we had the river house we had sidebar uh so it was it, it was great but it was not without uh many dark nights right I'm sure yeah yeah so you so you launch and and your restaurant's a success and and so you're having a taste of you know mm -hmm. uh of business success and what do you start uh, thinking about doing then? Another restaurant. So, <laughs> so, so we were pretty focused on building multiple units. And, uh, and we, for the first seven years, we opened up a restaurant every year, which is a lot more challenging then than it is now because we didn't have any resources. We didn't have, we didn't have you know, our, our foundation was pretty thin. We had, didn't have a management bench. The reason that we opened up so many restaurants so close to each other is I could act like general manager and oversee four restaurants and just buzz around the block versus, you know, having to get in the car and drive anywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit easier to execute that kind of plan. And that's and then as we grew, we were able to, you know, add talent and build build management structure and things like that. So going through that period of time and and growing your business um, and, and you've got your your two partners mm -hmm. and they were partners in everything that you did. That was the yeah. restaurant people. That was, that that's that was the fun? restaurant people. And it's yeah. still, that's the makeup of it today. We've yeah. added, we've added some like Aaron, who is our CFO. He's, he's a partner now. We, and, and Stavros who's coming in as our COO, he's a partner now. So, yeah. but, but the core Alan Peter and I've been together from the very beginning. Wow. Talk about that because for a lot of people, um, partners are tough. Right, very yeah. tough, and yet you guys have remained partners for a long, long time, time, and and, yeah. and uh, to your credit, yeah, I think I think uh, what it comes down to, it's like any relationship. I think egos get in the way of good partnerships, and I think we've been able to be respectful and understand each other's lanes and try not to cross or play in their lane, which is helpful. Now it happens, but. But I think we always have an approach that we're gonna we're gonna we'll work this out. It's only a moment, and we don't let that let that fester and build. Was there? Um, so let's talk about the obstacles, right? To to starting, um, was there was there fear to overcome? I mean, as you you leaving oh, a yeah. job and starting something, sure. There, obviously, there was a there was a lot of fear, but for me, it was something I always wanted to do. And I was young and I, I figured that I would be able to, if I started this and failed, yes, it'd be 
it would be very bad and dramatic and impactful, but it wouldn't be, you know, I, I could overcome it. Okay. I could go right. get another job. You lose go, 10 grand. Uh, yeah. I could, I, <laughs> yeah. Could, well, I could, I could go get another job right. making very similar money, you know, that, that right. type of thing. So I didn't have kids at the time. Right. I, I wasn't even, I, I was married, but we were, we were living in a, uh, a duplex that we, we rented out the front of it that made all the money. So I didn't have any housing expense. It was, so I was in a good place to do it. Yeah. Uh, which was critical, right? Cause adding that pressure on all the other pressures, is 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 a big challenge. So so it was the right time to take the jump, and, and it worked out. And I think that's great advice for anybody listening, for entrepreneurs out there. I mean, when you're young, yeah, that's the time to really take risk. I mean, don't wait to till you're fifty, like right. I did, when yeah. you have you know kids and which is uh, and uh, responsibilities and everything else. I mean, I, it's I think what you did was significantly harder than what I did. Okay. People who start their entrepreneurial journey later in life have to overcome a lot more than what a young person does, right? I wasn't, I didn't have children to, to I didn't have education costs. I didn't have, I, I didn't have those things to worry about, right? So, so I didn't have, you know, listen, let's be honest. Anybody at, at 50, your lifestyle is a little different than when you were 21, 22, mm -hmm. right? So, so a person taking that jump at that stage, it's, it's, it's a bigger jump and it's a bigger risk and it's more stressful, I believe. So, yeah. So well, kudos to you. Yeah. But that's good advice, yeah. you know, start. And I tell people that too. I tell my kids that take your, take risk yeah. when you're, when you're young, it's a lot, a lot easier to, uh, to overcome it. So let's talk about mentors Yeah, because I know yeah, a guy absolutely. who's kind of been one to you. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Let's, let's talk about him. Yeah. So, 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 uh, I, I can't say enough great things about having a mentor and my mentor, my mentor, Steve Hamos. And, uh, you know, it was a, uh, he's, he and I have been, uh, we've known each other for many, many years. Uh, we started doing business together in 98. Okay. So, so he's been way more than the business partner. He's been a real mentor, you know, he's almost, almost like a second father and, and, uh, and his guidance, and his perspective, just having someone to give you a different perspective, who has been through it, who has come out the other side of a situation. Because a lot of times when you're young and you're going through something, it is, it to, to you at the, at the time, that moment is the end of the world, right? And it's sometimes it's, it's great to get a balanced view of the other side, knowing that you can come through this and this is what it's gonna look like or could look like. And it gives you hope and, and that, that, that's, that's impactful, right? Yeah. And and when you see a mentor also teaches you how to be successful because they're successful, they're successful because of their approach in life, right? So if you take cues from how they approach life, there's reasons for people's success. I think that it's not, you know, I mean, yes, success is. Get, being successful at something is tough, but really it takes time, commitment, and focus. And if you have those three things, chances are you're going to be successful. Yeah. And for you, how did that, because there are probably people out there going, they would like to have a mentor. How did you, so there's a lot of credit to you about, you know, getting somebody like you know, Steve Helmos, very successful, legendary guy here. Man, yeah, how did you create that relationship so, with him? So, I, so I, I was very lucky about that because that, that's true. It, you know, it, it's not like uh, I was out soliciting for a mentor and Steve Hamill said, hey, you know, <laughs> yeah. he had a restaurant that was struggling and I knew him. He was a guest at Himrishi Barn Grill and I I knew him through that. And I was I, 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 I had a sense of the type of person he was. So he asked me to kind of help get my two cents and consult with him on this. And I did that and going through that process, we really hit it off together. And we ended up, well, we just kind of said, well, let's do this together and figure this out. And that was the River House. That was our first restaurant together. Yeah. It was called Reed's River House and we stepped in and changed the concept and kind of corrected its path. But, uh, you know, and, and, and going through that process, right? You kind of learn what type of person he is. And, you know, 
mentors and partners are critical. And a great partner isn't a good partner when the times are good. A great partner is a good partner when the times are bad. And Steve has always been a great partner. Wow. You know, yeah. I mean, we've gone through some, you know, there's no business that doesn't go upside right. down. Right? And, uh, you know, he, he's very fair. Uh, he is, I mean, again, he's a tough business guy, but he's a fair business guy. And, and, and he's very supportive of you. Uh, so he's, he's been great. He's been great to watch. He's been great to, to uh, kind of see how he approaches his businesses and his people. Uh, and it's been a great learning experience. He's been my, the best grad school I could ever have. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And he helped, you know, we sat at lunch, we were planning this bank. And that's right. That's gave, right. Gave me great advice. Yep. Uh, and, and uh, really appreciate that. So, so then you, you decided to do, it's kind of like the the restaurant you're best known for, I yes. think, is Yolo, uh, yeah. right? So tell us how you got started so, on Yolo. So that, that's a, that's a funny story. So actually, uh, uh, Steve uh, invited me out on a ski trip with his with his buddies, and Terry Styles was, uh, you know, late Terry Styles was was uh, on that trip with us, and uh, and we're all sitting around a table out after skiing, you know, having some cocktails and. At the time, that restaurant was empty. And, right, because it had been it, like it had been, three or four. It, it, it was five different restaurants. Five, okay. And, and uh, Terry was like, listen, Tim, you should put a restaurant right where that is. And, and, and yeah. the irony of that space was Ray, who Ray was working for Styles. Oh, yeah. And he tried to sell me that space before I did him or she. He tried uh -huh. to get us to do that. And uh, so I turned him down then. And now you fast forward. And Terry's like, let's do this. And I'm like, well, no, I, I would consider it if you would have funded. And then he said, well, I'll put some in and Steve puts some in. And then, it, and, <laughs> and then that's how you that's and, and he really at the, uh, at that table that, that Steve said, and we'll call it YOLO. You only live once. And you're on He life. came up with that? He came with up with it. And that was before Drake's song came out and everything. Yeah. Else. But, uh, and it also stands for you're on Los Olds, but not everyone knows that. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, uh, and that's, and we, we, uh, opened that business at that, that restaurant and, like you, it was, we opened it on uh, September 30th, which was the day the market crashed yeah. in 2008. Yeah, And it was our grand opening party. And I remember people <laughs> walking around going, I bet you're really happy you opened this. It's like, and, and you know how that is. You, you plan that for a year and a half. You don't know when it's going to open. Oh, my God. But, you know, it's, it's like everything. You, you, it's amazing how if you stick with it and just keep grinding – you'll come out the other side. And what I learned through that was, I, you know, obviously I thought it was going to be a disaster. Being opened on the day the market crashed, people are losing their jobs, the real estate market's falling apart. You know, I was like, how is this going to work? Right. But in hindsight, it was the best thing for YOLO, okay? Because we were the new kids on the block for two years. Nobody was opening new restaurants. We rode that new wave far longer than we would normally. Yeah, and it just kept going. So we, we were we were we were very pleased, and it was was very successful. And we just celebrated its fifteenth year last. Uh, wow! For this year, it'll be fifteenth year. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty rare. Yeah, the restaurant business yeah, yeah, too. Sure. You know, and still going strong. Yeah, 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 for sure. I've, I've had my share of martinis. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. I remember <laughs> from the very beginning, from the very opening days. That's right. Absolutely. Great, great place. Um, so you've also done a lot of uh, real estate investment yes. through the years. Yes. So how, how did that happen? So, so, so Alan was the, the guy in charge of the real estate for us, for the restaurant people. Um, and, you know, once, once the, restaurant gets open after the construction is done. He, Alan's not really in the day-to-day -day operations. Alan is in site selections, construction, all the front end, building it, design, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Uh, so as soon as he ends, he's like looking for work. Mm -hmm. So we used to valet park our cars to a hair salon on the corner. And uh, so he went and got that parcel under contract and he's like, let's do another restaurant. Now we are in operation six months 
And we are not in a, a mental space to say, let's go do another restaurant. We were working our tail off. And, yeah. and uh, but to his credit, he was, he was, uh, you know, certainly uh, pursuing that and trying to persuade us. And so I ended up saying, okay, well, we're going to be in the real estate side of that business too then. All right. And we'll, we'll, so he and I developed Urban Street Development, which is a real estate development company. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we realized is that as a developer, the hardest thing to lock down is the right F and B tenants, because you want to make sure they are good co-tenants. You want to make sure they are marking to the same type of demographic and crowd that your project is focused on. Uh, and, you know, the challenge with a lot of restaurants and bars is that they they go in undercapitalized and when it doesn't go right right does not go right off the bat they start to do things like three for one cocktails and all this other stuff that is may be counter to what you want to market to mm -hmm. and it's always a challenge to get all the tenants on the right page so when we were launching pro projects we were our own f and b tenants so we were able to curate the right, the consistent crowds and things like that. So what we learned also was that has tremendous value and it drives rental rates, right? So we should participate on that valuations. So, mm -hmm. and that's why we do both. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, what other things are you involved so, in now? Okay. Like so, the so, well, we, so we developed well, well, historically, we developed all the avenue lofts in Flagler. Mm -hmm. Then we did, uh, we had done three more loft projects over there. We just completed one called The Forge. It's a 40 unit project that just, uh, we, we just, we're full lease up now. Uh, we have, um, we now are doing a six and a half acre project with Heinz that has uh, 1,400 uh, parking spaces, 100,000 square foot of retail, 300,000 square foot office building, and about, call it 650 residential units. And that's being, we just demoed that, that, that uh, all those, it was where McGuire's was, right? right. All that area. So we, yeah. it took us about five and a half years to assemble all that. Wow. Uh, we were very fortunate. We did, we went through the planning process and Heinz, the, the global developer, the largest private global developer, uh, they saw the project on, uh, uh, one of our brokers' desks, and they're like, "What is this? We have a project similar to that. Very, very like-minded approach to how they look at real estate. Uh, they, they are to me. If Houston's is the gold standard in real estate, Heinz is the gold standard. I mean, Houston's in restaurants. Heinz is the gold standard in real estate. Interesting. Uh, and so we've been very fortunate. We've learned a great deal. We're going through that process now. Uh, we're, we should start." We should start, we, we're in demo now. We're hoping to start construction in September. Uh, we built a uh, entertainment district outside of uh, Doe Campbell Stadium for the Seminole Boosters yeah. called College Town. We, we started that project in 2012. We completed it in 2014. Uh, we're, we're actually, we have a hotel up there that we're expanding. We're doubling the size of that right now. It's a Hotel Indigo. Um, we, you know, we have a lot of different stuff going on. We, you know, you got, we, uh, uh, the, uh, 11. Oh yeah. Project? We just, we yeah. just, uh, opened Giselle above 11. Yeah. Uh, we have, we, we, we're entering the Miami market. We're doing a deal in Wynwood. Our next project to open on the restaurant side is new Bay, which is a rooftop that's above S3 at the Hilton there. We're opening that probably August, September. Uh, it's going to be a new rooftop lounge that, uh, that'll overlook the oceans, beautiful views. So we're going to open that in September. So there's a lot of exciting things on the, on the books for sure. So back in the old days, you, you, you know, you could run all these restaurants because mm -hmm. they were all close together yeah. and we, you know, go in there, always oh, see Tim, yeah. you know, uh, because people love seeing the Absolutely. owners, right? Absolutely. So how do you do it now? You got so many yeah. different restaurants and how do you keep your fingers on everything now? Well, first, I mean, obviously you have to have great people, right? And that's why we, we made our, 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 made some of our team partners in the business because sure. they, they are, they are grinding out every day. Uh, and, and again, my, my world is kind of twofold and it's almost like I have two jobs, right? I do my, my day start pretty early. Um, as, as you know, we've worked out many times at five thirty in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and then I, my real estate and administrative side of the restaurant business is in the daytime. 
And then I'm, like, I'm in the stores bouncing around at night, you know? Wow. So, yeah. so it's kind of how, now you can't get into every store, but you try to, you know, make it through. And, yeah. and it's really, it's really about communication to the team and, you know, being on the same page and that being on the same page takes continuous conversations. Right. Right. So a lot of people think it'd be great to open a restaurant, right? I mean, you hear it all the time. It's yeah, like yeah, Alan yeah. Hooper wants yeah, to open yeah. a bar. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, maybe that'll be next. Yeah. You know, we'll open a yeah. bar. Uh, what's your advice to people who, who think like that? Well, again, people, typically if you ask people why they want to <clears throat> open a bar, it's not, it's not because they think it's going to be a good investment. At the end of the day, if you ask people, it's, it, it's more emotional. It's more about them entertaining their friends. It's almost like their approach to having a house party. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, that's good and, advice. And, and that's why they want to get in the business. And that's the wrong reason to get in the business. Right. Because at the end of the day, people go and tell you they had a wonderful time at your house party because one, they're your friends and two, it was for free. Okay. <laughs> you take those equations out of that experience and their, their, uh, their feeling might be a little different. Right? Right, right. And so, you know, we, the restaurant business is very finicky. Okay. We have no stickiness. We've got no contractual obligations to our guests. They have no obligation to, we are only as good as the very last experience. And if, if it's their first experience and it's a bad experience, we're never getting them back again. If it's their third or fourth experience and it's a bad experience, we might get them back. So right. that's how that's how narrow our margin of error is. Sure. Okay. Uh, so people need to understand that there's a lot more that goes into the business and you should go get some education in the business. Go work for somebody so you can see that. Because there's a reason that 90% of these businesses fail, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you should definitely go get experience so you go in with eyes wide open because it's a business that's, if you're serving lunch and dinner, you're open 18 hours minimum, okay? Because you're there at eight o'clock to prep to get open for lunch. If you close at 10, you're there until midnight winding it down, okay? So at least. So, you know, people typically come out of, nine to five jobs, that kind of thing, where they have, you know, that's closed on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> All those things are off yeah. the table. And people, it's a, it's a rude awakening sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting. So if there's anything you could do differently as you look back on your career, is there anything that stands out that you'd do differently if you could do it over? Oh, yeah. I would be a much better student. And I would... Uh, I would, I would, you know, I'd probably go to law school, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, if there's one thing I, not to be a lawyer, but just to round out my arsenal as a businessman, huh. you know, Interesting. I think that law school, understanding contractual obligations, understanding how to read them, uh, understanding the law and how it works is very powerful and helpful because typically what happens is you often hire a lawyer to get their advice on the back end of a deal that is bad. And it's bad because you were unaware of what you were stepping into. Mm -hmm. If you had that knowledge going in on the front end, you wouldn't have those problems on the back end. And that's why I think it's powerful. That's interesting. That's great, great advice. So from, uh, from all the things that you've gone through, is there one particular setback that you uh, overcame that, that really stands out. Like I'm yes. glad I got through that. Like e yes. So so uh, we were involved in a landlord tenant dispute, and it was. It, it, I had never been in the litigation before, so I didn't know how that game was played, and it caused so many sleepless nights because. He, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're in a litigation, the, your attorneys are highlighting the potential risks that we face. Right. And, and where, where we may lose the case, right. Uh, small or large, you start to focus on that and, and 
that consumes you, right? And I was young at the time, and I didn't know how these things kind of play out. And going through that experience was very was uh, very impactful. It made me do much more diligence on the front end of something, uh, and and look at uh, contracts and things like that. You know, with with a lot more review and making sure I understand everything now. And and you know that's why I like like. Steve Helmos was great to have in my corner on that side because he had he'd been through this. He kind of knew he kind of he kind of helped me quarterback this whole situation. And and it was having someone like that, a mentor like that in the to calm you in those chaotic moments is is powerful. And that ties in with the law school. Uh yeah. <laughs> comment right. as well. So. But even now, I mean, yeah. I I find that that was like my mini you know, that was like going through that was like my mini law school. Right. And, sure. I, and now I, I'm, 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 I'm learning. I've learned how to read contracts. I've learned how to understand them better. All those types of things. Those are, those are the moments that, that I'm much better having gone through that now. And, I, and while that was really tough, I probably could have faced something significantly worse had not, had not gone through that because I would have just been, as you progress in your world, your deals get bigger and bigger. Right. And if, and those consequences get bigger and bigger if they f- fail. So having gone through on a smaller deal helped prep me for the bigger deals. Uh, that's good advice yeah. as well. So the, um, have, as you so you mentioned like the first deal you did, the, the, the him or she, you guys threw money together, mm-hmm. got friends and family as you expanded, um, how was raising capital and dealing with banks? How you have any stories so, so, about that? Oh, I've got a lot of stories about dealing with banks. <laughs> well, well, first off, yeah, you know better than anybody. Banks don't like restaurants, right? And I understand why they're 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 extremely risky. We have uh, our cash management is very intense. Okay, we it, it's it's eased over the last decade but prior it was such a cash intensive business that you know we're taking we're taking 40 fifty thousand dollar you know cash drops on the weekend and and you know turning around you know hundred thousand dollar drops after the weekend right yeah. so so it's a very cash intensive business uh and banks didn't like us because we were risky so we couldn't get a bank to look at us uh especially you know when I was when I was young I thought well you go to a big bank because they they will work with you because they have lots of customers, right? That's the mentality. <laughs> well, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> you go to a, if you go to a big bank, you are just a small p, uh, small fish in a big sea. So that doesn't that doesn't help. So that's when I started learning and understanding how a smaller bank, a community bank can be a much bigger asset to your business than a bigger bank. And we started working with small banks. And then, uh, you know, we were, we were with, um, uh, what was the first bank we were with? Uh, it, it, Robert Roshman, the Roshman family was uh, Landmark. Oh, Landmark, Landmark. Yeah. So that was our first small bank. We went right. from Bank of America. I, and the reason I moved, I couldn't, I couldn't even get a line of credit. I could get a line of credit on my, ha- Bank of America would give me a line of credit on my house for, three times what I was asking for on the business. And I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. And I'm carrying more in deposits at their bank than they're willing to lend me. I'm like, this, this relationship is very one-sided. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so uh, that's when I started learning about community banks and, and, and they've been very helpful through us through the years. Well, that's but, good. That's but good raising advice. money, people, it, listen, it's a risk reward thing. It's like I said before. Fools, friends, and family will give you your first money because they're going. They're, they're betting on you, and they're not even looking at the business, right. right? Okay. Then the next capital comes in. They're they're looking at your. They're looking at the business, and they're looking at you you as your reputation, right? Mm-hmm. And then and then when you start to grow your reputation, uh, and then we were very fortunate that I had some very well-heeled businessman who had great reputations in town that they gave me like the the seal of approval right because right. you know I, I was i was doing business with the styles family the the halmos 
family. The Hut Heising is the Hudson's family. So, you know, if if I screwed this up, I'd have to move. Right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm I'm not staying in town anymore. So, uh, and and that gave me a halo effect when other people wanted to get involved. They're like, okay, well, you know, he must be a good person. That's actually really great advice, I think, because uh, for for anybody who is raising money, it is if you first of all what you said about reputation, mm -hmm. you know what have you if, like the first one right? Yep. It's it's your friends, family, fools, right? But as you go on, it really is about your reputation. You. What have you done? And then if you've got people who are looked up to in the community who are saying, "I'm in with yeah. Tim Petrillo," it's kind of like, well, if he's in. Mm -hmm. Then we want to be threatened, right? But, but and there's a flip side of that. You know, they're in because the way that they're treated and the returns that that we you provide. But it's more about the way that you treat it. Because, like I said, not every business works. And yeah. if if you treat your partners as like if you treat your partners well, they're ultimately going to treat you well, right? right? And it's as the entrepreneur, it's your job. It's my job to make sure I treat them well. Okay, their obligation is their capital. And everything else after that falls on me. And I've always treated my partners like that. We're, we are, we are always the, we're, a TRP is the last to eat at the table with our partners. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we try to treat, put them first at every turn. Uh, and it's important and it's, it, it's, it's really bode well for me, but, but your point, you know, your brand and reputation is everything. And if I could make a recommendation is that, I got involved on charitable boards for, obviously I believed in the mission of the organization and I wanted to give back to the community and all that stuff. But a halo effect of that was I got to rub elbows with people that normally I would not be able to sit down at the same table. And when you're in a board setting, you get to know people and you kind of get to know as, as, you, you get to know them on a different level as how they approach things and in conversations and whatnot. And all of a sudden now the amount of deals that came to me through knowing people on in board situations, things like off market real estate stuff, uh, potential locations of developers that they've heard about, you might want to contact. It's invaluable. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is such a great networking opportunity. That's another great piece of advice, really, because, you know, you look at the people who are on most of the boards, they are the people who are doing things in the community, who are involved, who have businesses, who, who want to see the community be a better place for everybody. So I, I, that's I, yeah, really remember, good advice. I remember when I first, my, I, you know, we were huge supporters of Jack and Jill. So I, I was asked to be on the board and the, the board at the time consisted of Steve Hamos, Terry Styles, Mike Jackson, uh, um, uh, uh, Mark uh, from from the Heising Holdings. I mean, it was just it was incredible, and I would never be able to have conversations with that the, the, that level executive if I wasn't on, a, on yeah. a board like that. Yeah, at that time. So we're going to switch now. We we'll switch it up sure. a little bit. Go to the lightning round. Okay, which are just the quick uh, quick answers to to a few questions. Uh, your favorite book? I'm sure a lot of people said this, but Good to Great is that's the, a good one. Is uh, I think there's a lot of things in that book that I've applied to my, and continue to apply to my, my world. That's awesome. Uh, and we do have a library with all the books that oh, everybody yeah. recommends. It's right out here that we oh, lend, and then we have, you know, we lend the book. I'm sure someone's people. recommended that book before though, right? Actually, John Prince did yesterday. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Or was it, uh, was it John or was it uh, James? Might've been James Donnelly. Oh, actually. okay. It was James Donnelly okay. actually. So, but yes, that's a great book. What's a song from your youth that is like your theme song? Uh, themes, um, I would say, uh, Montel Jordan's, this is how we do it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say YOLO. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, we actually got in a lawsuit over that song, by the way, but that's, that's a side note. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, life is not fair. Just deal with it. Mm, that's a good one. What are you most grateful for today? Well, obviously, uh, my health. Uh, my family and loved ones, and you know, I've been, I've been, I've been extremely lucky. I mean, I have. I've been blessed in so many ways that uh, I'm very, I'm very fortunate. I'm very grateful every day. There's not That's a day that goes by that I don't say, you know, I lucked out. That's great. 
What's uh, your favorite movie? Uh, actually, Crazy Stupid Love. I love that movie. I, it just makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to say The Godfather. No, but, you know. Um, what's a favorite travel destination for you? Um, well, I look at destinations a little differently. You know, I I, I like to. I so the hospitality world is is very driven by by things I see elsewhere, right? Our, our, yeah. our business. So I, I like to go to places that are doing really unique things. And so Dubai is on my list now and I want to go, I'm going there uh, over in November. Cool. Yeah. So Nice. Okay. This can just be one word answer. Okay. Because we don't want you going off on this one because people have gone off on this. Okay. So AI scared or optimistic? Well, both, but more <laughs> optimistic. Okay, oh, yeah, good but much more optimistic. It's hard to it's hard to pick one or the other, but no, I'm but optimistic. Good. I think it's going to change our worlds. I mean, it's going to change the restaurant industry dramatically. Wow. So, um, when you um, this is a tough one to ask you, but favorite restaurant, <laughs> I'll, okay. other than one of yours? Okay, my favorite restaurant uh, in town. Uh, yeah, so okay. we can go there, you know. Okay, our- so I would have to say uh, uh, Martiranos. I mean, that, that in, it, because it ha- I have a history with Steve, uh, meaning that uh, when I was at Mark's, all his guys from Philly, when he first moved down here, worked for me. And then they moved. I celebrated my 25th birthday at that restaurant. The <laughs> night before our kids were born, I celebrated dinner there. You know, so it's been very special. And I go there probably once or twice Probably once a week, twice a week. Once, uh, I had to go there a lot. So. Okay, good enough. And then uh, if you could have dinner yep. with uh, one person living or dead, who would that be? Michael Jordan. Wow. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, listen, this has been great, Tim. It's no, great it's catching been... up and uh, and hearing about all the great things you're doing. Well, thank you for having me. Done. It, was, it was nice. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, you can go to our websites. Every every comment goes right to me, okay? Or I, I, you can find me on my LinkedIn. I'm not on social media, so I'm under the restaurant people and social media outlets. But uh, every every comment to any of our restaurant goes directly to me as well. So I get in touch with me or on, on LinkedIn. Cool. All right. Well, thanks right. a lot. Thank That's you. great. Thanks for tuning in to Locality's Making Bank podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to catch the latest episodes and visit localitybank.com today to learn more about all the benefits of banking local.